In this video, um, I'll try to kind of summarize the individual periods, literary periods or streams from the beginning of the 20th century with the onset of post of modernism and up to the uh, first dystopian and science fiction tendencies. And the main uh, aim of this video is to actually kind of uh, um, explain or point out links between the individual periods, what were the origins or uh, what were the reasons for the formation or for the startup of the individual movements. Uh, I'm not going to discuss in detail the individual principles or typical features, but more like uh, to explain the the fundamental backgrounds of individual movements, how these movements are linked from the historical or cultural or maybe from the political point of view, and uh, maybe what are the common features of dystopia and, for example, the works of George Orwell, or maybe um, what are or whether we can find uh, some features of political fiction in Virginia Woolf or James Joyce. And thus we can actually answer the question whether the hundred year old uh, works of the authors like James Joyce or Virginia Woolf, uh, whether the traces found in these works are present in the modern or latest works or not, in other words, whether what these two authors, for example, wrote in their legacy, whether it's still valid and what, whether it still can influence or kind of impact even the works belonging to a completely different, different genre like science fiction or dystopia, for example. Uh, we're talking uh, uh, about the beginning of the 20th century um, with James Joyce and Virginia Woolf. Uh, these two authors are like the milestones of British and also Irish literature and generally speaking of the world literature as such uh, because they laid the first uh, essential principles of modernist movement, modernist literary tendencies with their works. Um, the key work for you uh, in case of uh, James Joyce is probably Ulysses and in case of Virginia Woolf, uh, either to the lighthouse or maybe for some, Mrs. Dalloway. So, like I said, I'm not going to discuss in detail the individual principles and the rules or, or how you can actually characterize these, uh, these movements or the works written in modernist uh, era, and more like what were the reasons behind the creation or formation of the individual movements. So as for modernist movement, speaking of Joyce and Wolf, uh, it was mainly uh, the question of reaction, several reactions. One of them was the reaction to the First World War. Uh, as you uh, probably remember that in Mrs. Dalloway, there is a character who actually suffers from post-war uh, depression uh, or uh, the the consequences of, of the of the battles and the fights uh, in, uh, in in during the first world war uh, in James Joyce there are also uh, some interesting political nuances and political questions along with religious questions those are then present for example also in Evelyn Waugh or in George Orwell but uh, it was mainly a reaction on the, the horrors of the First World War. Uh, that's from the historical point of view and from the cultural point of view, uh, we can say that the works of these two authors uh, were the reactions to the sociopolitical changes and also kind of, uh, it was the result of the ever going, ever developing, uh, previous movements, uh, you remember that uh, we, the last, one of the last movements that we actually talked about last, uh, during the previous courses were uh, aestheticism and decadence, and there were some first traces and first hints of, of the 
future modernist movement, the abandon uh, the abandonment of the traditional um, structure of literary work, the the development of new techniques, literary techniques, for example, stream of consciousness, uh, also the fragmentary nature of the text, uh, very complex characters, then uh, the playfulness of the dialogues, the monologues also, or, or the descriptive uh, qualities of the works and so on and so forth. So these were actually the outcomes of the ever developing uh, movements like aestheticism and decadence and uh, at the same time we um, can hardly trace any uh, features of romanticism or realism in in <clears throat> in modernist works per se because uh, uh, the previous movements were more or less easily cl uh, classifiable or def uh, easily defined because they had their fundamental principles and fundamental features, qualities, and um, they usually did not overlap each other. That, that was the tendency towards the end of the 19th century and at the beginning of the 20th century when the genres and the styles started to overlap and uh, it actually uh, got really serious in, in the next movements or during the, during the next eras when we talk about political fiction or when we talk about the works of Evelyn Waugh uh, where he actually combines the questions of religion, question of sexuality, politics, culture, art uh, and uh, it's, it's all actually getting together uh, there are also some romantic aspects we could we could dispute about it we could discuss and we could discuss it for long hours but um, the the problem is that uh, even though the uh, the authors of the modernist movement they try to bring something new uh, as Israel Pound actually coined this this term or this this quote. Uh, that modernist movement, especially in postmodernist movements, should bring something new or make it new. They uh, breached the traditions, the traditional rules, but at the same time, they uh, they s s were still trying to stick to some traditional working functional principles, which actually uh, could be understood as the main framework of the work. Uh, so on the on, on the outside, the work might uh, be in just uh, just just another book, uh, comprising of some complex uh, story with complex characters, but it's a novel that counts, for example, 400 pages, and uh, you can read it uh, within a couple of weeks uh, if you're willing to do so. Uh, but uh, at the same time, on uh, on this, uh, that's the surface level, but on uh, deeper inside, you actually uh, realize that these works are much more complex than, for example, the works of uh, Bronte sisters or Charles Dickens. Uh, those works were not that complex from so many points of view, you know, on the on textual level, on the, on the, on the level of the, the description of the characters or the complexity of the characters, symbolism and other stuff. So, uh, it was a very interesting situation that the authors were trying, they were not trying to copy or imitate the previous, uh, previous tendencies. They wanted to be original, bring something new to the world. And they were trying to reflect the uh, sociopolitical and cultural situation in the world. So as for the modernist movement, it was, uh, for example, the reaction uh, to the First World War. In case of Virginia Woolf, uh, it's, uh, it's the question of human rights, uh, especially women's rights and the, uh, the role of men and women within the society with special focus on women. But uh, the way Virginia Woolf actually uh, understood the questions of feminism or feminist uh, problems uh, is much, much different from the latest tendencies or latest trends. But uh, that's again uh, that opens the space for discussion maybe for in the next in the next video or in, on some other occasion uh, so uh, to define uh, 
very briefly, or to kind of sum up modernism movements, uh, they brought something new with their new textual uh, techniques, like fragmentation, stream of consciousness, uh, parallax, ellipsis, and other stuff, have a rich symbolism, uh, then uh, also uh, the stories and sometimes the controversy related to the sexuality or the, or the questions of the role of men, women, or even kids within the society. Uh, because these, these authors, they were actually, uh, among other things, they were addressing future generations, generations of those who were to be born uh, in, the, in the following years and decades. And the fact that we actually are still studying and reading their works proves that they were actually right. And their, their, uh, their interest was spot on and that it still works. Um, so the modernist, modernist uh, movement was like the precursor for the, for the next interesting, interesting stuff uh, that was happening in, within the British literature as such. Uh, another uh, part of the, you can say like the, like the bridging, bridging uh, period between modernist and postmodern tendencies, uh, we, we could talk about a very interesting author, Joseph Conrad. And uh, if James Joyce actually kind of hinted at the questions of morality, or maybe he uh, only showed very, very, well, of course, uh, in those times when, he, when his works were published, uh, for example, Ulysses, uh, some of the descriptions of the sexual intercourse or sexual acts or the, the provocative scenes of, of women and men, in those times they were really, really controversial, but from our point of view in the 21st century, they are not that much controversial or maybe rude or strange. But still, there were some hints and there were some just posed questions by James Joyce, for example, and also Virginia Woolf regarding, for example, the morality or immorality of a human being. And that is exactly what Joseph Conrad was dealing with. So the following authors, actually, to uh, make it brief, the following authors, including Joseph Conrad, they, uh, they knew about those previous authors and they actually tried to focus on their own questions, often related to their own personal life. So in case of Joseph Conrad, we know that uh, he was heavily affected by his traveling experiences and uh, he, was question, he was questioning the, the nature of a human being, the morality, immorality, the darkness and the brightness of a human soul. And even the motive of uh, sailing, uh, cruising the seas and the oceans is like a metaphor for a man's journey through his life or her life. Uh, while we can actually encounter various things, sometimes we can encounter blessings when we discover a paradise island with beautiful native people, indigenous people who are very hospitable and, and friendly. And on the other hand, we, we might encounter people living on some other island who are quite, uh, quite uh, dangerous and dark. And uh, from our point of view, we can exploit those people for our own benefit or we can help them. So Joseph Conrad actually offers the question of dichotomy of, of human soul, of human nature. And... Uh, in such works like Lord Jim, for example, or Heart of Darkness, he explores these contexts and these discourses uh, in, a very, in a pretty interesting way. Uh, for example, Heart of Darkness, it's, uh, it's not a very long work. You can read it within a day, but it offers very, very provocative, for some people, very pro provocative questions of human um, soul and human nature. Uh, there was, uh, then there was another gentleman who uh, was interested in uh, also human nature as such, the human soul, uh, but he was trying to investigate this 
topic or this discourse from a different point of view. Uh, Joseph Conrad is sometimes referred to as a very pessimistic, very dark author, because he was, uh, he, was, uh, he was inclined towards that negative side of human being. Whereas Evelyn Waugh, uh, the man behind me, uh, he was uh, actually examining the same things, the same discourses, but from the point of view of humor. And uh, it's more precise from the point of view of satire. So he was actually mocking the, uh, the bad qualities of human nature, immorality, uh, infidelity, uh, also making fun of somebody else, uh, breaking of traditions. And not only that, uh, there is one topic that actually is almost recurrent in almost every uh, literary movement uh, after, the 20, after, the, after the 20th century or after the beginning of the 20th century, and that is religion. Uh, James Joyce's uh, questions of religion were not that explicit. Uh, Virginia Woolf's questions of religion were not that specific or explicit. Uh, in case of only war, it's much more explicit uh, because there were two main discourses or two main questions he was dealing with in his works. And there are two special terms for this, and that is Catholicism and medievalism. Catholicism, uh, Emily Wall uh, was an interesting person who actually struggled uh, with himself, whether he is or not, whether he's not a believer. And um, he actually converted uh, and his point of view towards God and religion changed uh, in the course of his lifetime. And so the questions of Catholicism, the question of re uh, religion, faith in God, or non-believing in God, was one of the most prominent questions in his works. Another thing, uh, we can say that uh, Evelyn Waugh was in, in, a certain w in a certain way a traditionalist. And this is related uh, to another term, uh, that is medievalism. Evelyn Waugh was criticizing the novelties of his, of his age, of the, of the 40s, 50s, and 60s because uh, of the uh, oncoming 50, uh, 60s, because uh, he didn't like the way people behaved. He didn't like uh, that people were trying to avoid, for example, or disobey the traditional uh, rules and um, almost loss of some righteous uh, way of living, going to the church, believing in God, being a pious person, uh, who is not uh, too much explicit sexually or physically. Uh, so Wall was, uh, by his contemporary, sometimes described as, uh, as somebody who loved people, but at the same time, somebody who hated people. Uh, it, was, it was a very controversial uh, breaking point. If, if we were to analyze his personality, we would have to read many resources and probably we would, we would never reach the ultimate uh, resolution what kind of person he was. But uh, literature is not about uh, reading or investigating the author about the works that he wrote. And uh, through his works and through the satirical humor, very spicy way of uh, using humor and satire in his works, through which he actually commented on and uh, also criticized uh, the way of life and the, the novel uh, forms of lifestyle in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. He actually uh, expressed his own thoughts and feelings about those times. As for medievalism, he was a person who wished somewhat internally for the return of those traditional medieval uh, customs and uh, beliefs uh, and uh, medieval values, so to say. Uh, because in medieval times, in Middle English literature, uh, we talked about uh, such, uh, such stuff as uh, uh, the plot consisting of a hero who has, does not have supernatural powers, but he's still kind of noble, elegant, and brave. 
it was usually this uh, knight in a shining armor, uh, riding his horse and going to to some battle or to some crusade. And uh, he was in platinum glove with some lady, uh, but this did not involve any any physical contact. And he was uh, a role model of the of the society with with his uh, bravery and with his uh, accomplishments as a hero, as somebody who was not scared, maybe. But at the same time, he was probably scared, but in the eyes of the average persons, he was very brave and uh, often paid his, uh, his own life for the accomplishment, for saving a lady, for example, damsel in distress, and so on and so forth. Also the camaraderie or the friendship among among people, among men, uh, that is today looked upon as something strange, at least, or weird, or unusual. But in those times, people didn't understand it this way. Uh, also, uh, the courtly love, yeah, that's, that's the relationship towards, towards a woman from a more platonic point of view. Uh, also, the obedience of God and the church. Uh, Helping each other, helping your, uh, helping thy, uh, thy neighbor, and your friends, your family, respecting your parents, and so on and so forth. So these were the traditional values uh, and principles of medieval times, and th those were actually transferred into the into the age and into the thinking of Ellen Waugh, uh, and it was called or nicknamed medievalism. So, if you were asked about medievalist tendencies in Ellen Waugh, you would be able to actually. Uh, answer that question. Uh, so modernist and postmodern movements were heavily uh, focused on human being as such, and but not only on the surface level, but more uh, from that deeper perspective. Human soul, human heart. How are we interlinked among each other? Do we have some strange, uh, maybe supernatural, transcendental connections among each other? Or are we separated? Uh, do we live in, in, in some kind of bubbles? And do we just uh, interact with each other when we need it? Or, and otherwise we only stay alone, individual at homes, in the offices, uh, and anywhere else. And this, uh, point of view how to see a human being was offered by another uh, prolific author and, and I would say a genius author and that was Samuel Beckett so that's the gentleman behind me and Samuel Beckett uh, again he put the the human being in a very harsh strange post apocalyptic conditions and he was dealing with uh, with the question of human soul and human nature. What are we? What is the purpose of life? So borrowing the questions and principles of the uh, existential philosophy, uh, he was investigating these questions. Uh, if we were actually, when we are born into this world, are we born into uh, some idealistic world that we can build our own world that is good, or maybe perfect, with good friends and uh, and uh, a family a family that we can rely on, or is it just uh, some kind of a an illusion? And in reality, we are actually all alone, and um, the meaning of life can never be understood. So these were interesting questions posed by Samuel Beckett, and um, uh, maybe he to some readers or maybe listeners to his to his plays, uh, he would sound rather demonic. Uh, and dark again, similarly to, for example, Joseph Conrad. Uh, but at the same time, you remember that if you were to see the performance of, for example, The End Game or Waiting for Godot, uh, you would laugh a lot during his place. And that, that was, again, a recurring motive. Uh, the way of using or utilizing humor, uh, strange ways of commenting on human nature and humans as such, also through humor. And it's all packed in, in this case, in dark post-apocalyptic environment. And those were, at the same time, the first hints and tendencies. I don't know whether 
Beckett realized this. Maybe he wasn't, or maybe he didn't consider himself a prophet. But anyway, he actually, uh, he set the first standards and principles of the, of the latest science fiction and dystopian genres because the characters of his plays are often set in, in similar environments and they have to cope with life. Life for his characters is, not, is nothing short of um, a curse, for example. For many a characters of his, it's not a blessing to be born into this world. It's more like a curse. Um, <clears throat> then to be more specific on another field of interest, that is politics, for example, sociopolitics, uh, we can shortly comment on uh, George Orwell. And uh, also, if we, if we turn back uh, to uh, Samuel Beckett, along with George Orwell, these were the reactions to the horrors of the Second World War. So in case of Virginia Woolf or James Joyce, there were reactions also among, uh, among the other ones, the reaction to the First World War. And in the case of Samuel Beckett and George Orwell, it was the Second World War and the consequences of this armed conflict, the global conflict, posing the questions uh, about the future of the humankind, uh, the future of human beings. What is uh, the, the fate or destiny of human beings? Are we uh, predestined to become extinct or will we reach the point of a very sophisticated civilization uh, in which everything seems to be quite normal, but at the same time, it is a, an artificial system that only serves those who serve the system. So you know that in 1984, those who go along with the system, they're quite fine and safe. And those who try to oppose it or fight it they become the threat to the system. And we, dis we discussed it, uh, this, sim this uh, question, similar question in dystopia lecture. So uh, Orwell was asking these questions and uh, he offered also very interesting characters and interesting descriptions of characters, not only in 1984, but even maybe even more symbolically in Animal Farm. And, um, Maybe if you are not brave enough, or um, if you are not that much interested in reading that book, Animal Farm, but it's not that long, it's manageable within one or two days, uh, you can actually kind of partly uh, connect or reconnect to this topic uh, while listening to an interesting progressive album, rock album by Pink Floyd. The album is called Animals, surprisingly, and there are songs called Dogs, Sheep, and picks three different ones, which actually borrow the motives and principles from the animal farm. And uh, through the lyrics, uh, the, the members of this uh, rock band back then in 1977, they were commenting on the sociopolitical situation in the, uh, in, in the, uh, in the UK. Uh, so it's uh, almost a some some kind of a musical allusion to George Orwell's Animal Farm. Uh, so uh, the the way of uh, the way actually Orwell constructed uh, his works, for example, in Animal Farm, is not that much, uh, or does not go that much against the traditional rules that you would find in in the books written 150 years ago. Uh, but the topics or the discourses that, are, that he deals with in his books uh, were and maybe still are uh, rather controversial and surprising. And there, were, there are even uh, theories that actually what Orwell described in his book 1984 is already happening in this world. But I covered this topic uh, shortly in the dystopia lecture, so I want to delve deeper into it. Into it. Uh, so on the surface level, Orwell is not maybe that much uh, complex but <clears throat> regarding his style, but the questions that he posed, uh, that he posed in his works, 
uh, are still valid and still relevant even in the 21st century. Uh, what he actually hinted at, besides other things, is this. And that's uh, the world that uh, suppresses the traditional religi religionistic values and views, the world that uh, has set the system and you are put into that system. And uh, if you follow the system, you are okay. And if you go against it, uh, you are an enemy of the state. So you can choose, you can either live here or here. So a civilized state or country ruled by fair, friendly government that gives you everything you need. You don't need to ask for more or for anything else. Or you can try living in this environment, uh, secluded, always on the run, hiding, and maybe just pretending that you are fighting the system. So uh, this is uh, actually hinted in Orwell's political fiction, dystopian fiction, partly. So but the genre of dystopia was already covered in the previous lecture, so I'm not going to delve deeper into it. Uh, maybe the question is, was it the reaction to something real that was going on in the world in, the, in those times when it actually evolved during the 50s and 60s? And the answer is yes. And it was a uh, great conflict, uh, not armed conflict, more or less, but still very dangerous. And that was the Cold War. The world was divided, just like on this picture, uh, in the Western and Eastern Bloc, and the nations were actually kind of fighting in inverted commas, fighting against each other. They were racing to reach the goals. For example, there was there was space race during those times, 50s and 60s. Uh, remember Apollo program, yeah, or the Soviet uh, space program. Uh, so uh, not only on Earth but also in the space. Um, and the questions of which system is good and uh, which system is fair and which system is not were among many other uh, dealt with or, or disputed uh, in the dystopian genre. And dystopian genre set the, uh, the trends or the pathway to the last movement that we actually deal with in this course, and that is uh, science fiction. The question of, uh, you remember that in 1984, there were descriptions of a pretty much developed technologies like the TV sets with, with, with the cameras, uh, Big Brother, somebody uh, who, is, uh, who stands for the government, who is watching you, he's watching every, your, uh, every step that you make uh and uh, everything you do actually and uh you are being evaluated every day whether you are a good citizen or not whether you are dangerous to the society or not and through these technologies people living in such system they might easily turn into robots or automatons automatons were already uh hinted in james joyce or for example vladimir Nabokov. uh so uh those were the first, uh, first indices that the world might turn into something like this. Uh, people uh, destroying the environment and thus forced to live under some huge bubble to be protected from, from the radiation, from the, from the toxic fallout or whatever. And at the same time, people uh, trying, to, trying to live with uh, something like this or maybe turning into something like this, the robots, then also the question of the existence of aliens or alien life forms, the alien invasion, the yeah, alien attack, already mentioned, already actually uh, offered by H.G. Uh, Wells in his World of the Worlds. Uh, but uh, in science fiction, we can actually say, we can safely say that if we Try, if we dissect this genre of science fiction, we can find uh, 
the tendencies of all the previous movements that we have covered so far, we can find the questions of religion because the existence of alien life forms, if it ever is confirmed, it will definitely um, come into clash with traditional religious beliefs, belief in God. And then again, okay, if there are some aliens, who created them? God? Probably yes. If you are a believer, like me, for example, my answer would be yes, they were created by God. The entire universe was created by God. And God is not, uh, we cannot recognize, we cannot know him, yeah, but that, those are, those, those are you know, other questions related to other stuff, or other fields. But then again, also the, the na human nature, whether we are still humans, yeah, or whether we are turning into robots or maybe aliens, who are we? Where do we live? Your, uh, the, uh, the attitude towards the natural environment or natural, if we look at this, the question is what is still nature and whether we still have some nature left? Uh, so uh, also the darkness and or the brightness, so to say, of human soul, uh, topics uh, discussed in or by Joseph Conrad. Then the isolation of a human being uh, living in the post-apocalyptic uh, or maybe alien world, yeah, that was hinted by Samuel Beckett. Then uh, maybe the humoristic, almost ironical quality to life yeah, people might live in, in the future, maybe 100 years or maybe in 200 years, uh, the existence of human being, beings would be or will be ironic. Despite what we have done to the natural environment, our existence would be a big joke. And maybe there will be authors who will express their, um, uh, their opinions on human existence as that we don't actually deserve uh, and or maybe that it's, it's a big surprise that we are still here despite what we have done to nature to the forests rivers oceans and to ourselves uh, in the end so satire and humor then of course the question of uh, politics the governments the systems that we live in who and how will govern the world the future world maybe invaded by aliens, maybe uh, ruled by the robots, who knows, living under the, under the dome or some, some, in some capsule, yeah. Then uh, time traveling and other stuff, but especially uh, the role of politics and politicians and governments, just like in Orwell. And, uh, and then again, the technologies and stuff. So it's, kind of cyclical and at the same time it, it is all distilled in the genre of science fiction. It doesn't mean that all the previous movements and genres are not important and that everything actually collides and clashes within science fiction. It, uh, it doesn't mean that science fiction genre is the epitome of all the previous genres but uh, it is true that you can find almost every or all of them on those previous discourses within this genre. And that is also why the genre of science fiction is so popular these days, even more with the development of the technology. Um, apart from science fiction, there is also a genre of fantasy, uh, but that is a, a rather different genre from science fiction. The biggest difference between science fiction, uh, science fiction and fantasy is that Science fiction is usually based on, at least partly, on, on the technologies or on the facts, uh, on the technologies that already exist. Whereas fantasy uh, is usually a complete imagination, visualization, or some kind of mirage uh, of the world that actually doesn't exist or probably will never exist, including the animals and the creatures and uh, maybe the technologies that actually cannot exist. Uh, so uh, you just need to compare, for example, um, A Space Odyssey uh, by Arthur C. Clarke and uh, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings.
in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, you can you you will never find, and you don't find spaceships, robots, androids, cell phones, uh, laser guns, and so on and so forth, because it's a fantasy. And uh, although uh, many people would love uh, if such world existed, maybe in even including the monsters and, and orcs and uh, also the elves and the people and the hobbits and, and so on and so forth, uh, including myself, yeah, I would also love if such world existed, but it's, it's just an imagination and it's usually not based on what already exists or what existed. Whereas science fiction is more technical or technically uh, inspired genre compared to fantasy. So that's the main and biggest difference that you need to know. So that was uh, uh, modernist and postmodernism uh, or modernist and postmodernist tendencies in a nutshell. I hope it, uh, it helps you at least a bit to understand the, the links and how it actually evolved. And uh, uh, I hope that I actually uh, told you what are the key uh, motives, discourses and key uh, elements of the individual movements or, or genres that you need to stick to to understand them. So that will be all from my side. Uh, just remember that uh, the key personalities that we talk about, uh, James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, Joseph Conrad, then of course, Evelyn Waugh, George Orwell, Samuel Beckett, uh, in case of uh, dystopia, political fiction, again, we can partly talk about George Orwell, uh, and in case of dystopia and science fiction, there are many other authors you can choose. Uh, well, as with the previous ones, uh, there are some uh, who are considered to be the key representatives of those genres. So th thank you very much for your attention, and I hope to see you again in the next video. So, bye-bye.